The Bluetooth device is ready to pair. PC Cortina City on Project Bramble on another tech vid. Welcome aboard. Hello, good evening, and welcome. And this is a cruise control build video. We're going to fit cruise control to the Mark III Cortina. And this first video, this first tech video, is all about getting the cruise up and running so we can understand the principle of operation. We've got a cruise control unit, we've got a vacuum pump that pulls on the cable the accelerator these two items need to connect together we need to get a speed input signal into there and some basic controls we want this to be working on the bench we've got a signal generator to simulate our road speed we've got a power supply we've got all the stuff we need to get these items up and running so we can fit cruise control to the Cortina come along to the bench let's see if we can get it going Okay, on with the cruise. Before I take you onto the bench, because we've got some that's set up there, we're going to go back to school. We got the whiteboard. I'm going to talk you through how the cruise works. We're going to sketch it out, me and you together. We tilt you down, down to the board we go. Hopefully, this is going to work. Okay, let's have a see. We've got, I'm just trying to, what I'm trying to do, the image is reversed in the viewfinder, which makes life tricky for me. There, about there. I think we'll work for you. Let's start with the components we've got. The actual computer itself, the ECU. We've got the speed coming off the gearbox, which we call VSS. Vehicle speed. We've got brake light bulb, brake. We need all these features. Foot operated pedal for the brake pedal. Foot operated switch, brake pedal. We've got, what else we got? We've got switches, in our case on the steering column. There's two of those. We draw them in like this. They both coming up to positive. So they're going to positive and they go straight into the cruise control unit. So that tells it to set, set your current speed and coast. That's all you have to control it uh, in terms of the input from the driver anyway other than the brake pedal. We've also got, as well as that, we've got a pump, a vacuum pump. So just put vac in there. That's effectively a motor, and which creates, and that goes to a vac tube here, which goes to a set of bellows, like air bellows, and that goes to a cable, which pulls on your engine. So let's put throttle. So it's on your, it's on your carburetor. Or, or the um, part of your fuel injection system, depending on what you were set up, in our case, carburetor. So, the vacuum pump and motor goes to the ECU, it has three cables, it's got the motor, it's got the ground, and it's got a dump valve. What the motor is able to do is create the vacuum in the bellows, an atmospheric pressure then, if you ever um, you draw something, let's say, uh, what's the best way of describing it? Um, suck on a straw and um, in a bottle, the bottle starts to collapse because of the atmospheric pressure. Anything that you create a vacuum, atmospheric pressure pushes on it. So, trying to think of a good example, the straw in a, in a, a drink's not the best one, is it? Uh, what can we think of? 
if you blow up a balloon, but then if you suck out on a balloon, the balloon sort of shrivels up like that. It's like that idea anyway. Negative pressure. The vacuum pump and motor and a little dump solenoid, there's three items. They draw on the bellows and because there's no air leakage, the bellows will stay wherever it stops at. But to get them to expand back out, it has a little dump valve which lets air back in. So all this does is just draw in and out depending on whether you're operating the little dump valve here or you're drawing oxygen, air, air in to create a negative pressure which atmosphere, atmosphere pushes on the bellows. That's all they are. Now that creates quite a bit of pulling force. I think that's Newton meters. There's a terminology for pulling force. Can't quite remember it. I think it's Newton meters. Which pulls on the throttle cable with enough pulling force to open your throttle on your car or let the throttle spring back. No force for it to spring back, of course. So that pump is how the ECU controls the revs. It just draws on a vacuum, creates a vacuum in a set of bellows. The bellows collapse, pull on a cable. At certain points, there's a little tiny dump valve that operates and that creates the bellows to come back out because it lets the air back in. And by cycling those two, you can get the bellows to kind of like operate on that pulling that cable in and out depending and it can be quite fine how it does it. That little dump valve only lets a little bit of air out. So little pulses on it, little click click clicks, makes the bellows sort of click 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 out. Then a little pulse on the pump will bring them in. ECU does all that work. That's all built into the software of the chip. All hardwired, all hard encoded into the into the uh, the microchip there. We don't need to concern ourselves with that sort of self-contained unit with a multi-plug on the bottom. So the vehicle speed sender signal, vehicle speed signal, that is just a little little thing that bolts on the back tail shaft of the gearbox and it's a magnet on a shaft that's spinning round, rotating this little magnet inside the sensor, or it could be an Opto one where it breaks a light beam, there's two types. And the Opto one's an Opto encoding wheel, sort of with tabs on it. There's two types of speed sensor anyway, but they both create pulses. Now pulses are, are signified in electronics by this waveform. If they're square wave, if they're even pulses, they end up being this nice square shape. If you imagine these, let's do a bigger version of them. Each time that square, it's, this is 0 volts and this can be 12 volts. Okay, as the magnet comes around and hits the little magnetic sensor inside the little speed sensor, it's all in a metal case in this, bolted on the gearbox. The little wheel would come around, the sensor picks up the magnet, and when it does it, it switches 12 volts on. So you've got nothing coming out, it's got three wires on it as well, it's got uh, ground it's got 12 volts to actually power it up and then it's got its actual output. But we don't need to concern ourselves with those three wires, just the, the output one. It looks like this. The wheel turns around, it hits the magnet inside the little sensor, then it becomes 12 volts there. If this was a graph showing 12 volts and 0 volts was the bottom. It stays on for a little while till the magnet passes out of range of the sensor and then it drops back to no power, no volts. Turns around, keeps turning the wheel and it, another, it's made a second revolution now so the magnet comes back round to the sensor, 12 volts goes back on for this amount of time here. Passes the sensor again and it's out again and just keeps repeating that. So really if you took the, the waveform away, all you've got is 12 volts on, 12 volts on, 12 volts on, 12 volts on, like that, just like a bulb would flash, that's all it's doing. But in, in electronics it's represented this way, if you traced it out, so that's why it's called square wave, and that's why you, when you see diagrams of them, they're always shown as that um, pattern. There's different types of waveforms, but for our, you've got something called sawtooth as well, but they're, they're not as important to uh, think about for this, we just need that square wave signal. So that is pulsing off and on, the faster the car goes, the faster them pulses go, and the ECU counts them pulses, that's all it does. In it goes there, so we'll have a wire for that. We're going to have three wires for the motor, 
the dump valve, the common ground, and then the 12 volts for the actual motor pump. So that's a free cable affair. This will only have one cable coming in, although you do need to connect 12 volts ground to your sensor. Two more wires will be coming in for the switches here. To, so they're on your steering column. I want to I want to set the control on. I want to coast. I want to resume. So set, coast, and resume. They do similar functions. The brake wire bulb. The brake line needs to come into it. So we've got to fit the brake line wire that goes in. That goes straight to across the brake bulbs. They're grounded in the boot of your car, but that has to that has to strap across the brakes because. It, it, it has to know that there's a bulb present, it's part of the safety feature. Your cruise won't work if you've got no brake bulbs. It doesn't, it wouldn't, you couldn't, you can actually get it to work without them if you wanted, but you'd have to reprogram the software. But the way they do it is, for safety, that wire has to make it to a, a proper working brake lamp bulb. If you've got LED tail lights, the cruise won't work. You've got to put a resistor in to simulate the original old style 21 watt bulb. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I found that out the hard way. So, it has to be that filament because it can it can measure the resistance through the filament to ground, and it knows it as a bulb present. It needs that for safety. And it also, when you apply the brake pedal, let's say you're on 12 volts either side of your brake pedal, it puts 12 volts down that line and and it cuts kills the cruise, knocks it out, and it dumps all the vacuum out as well. They also have a safety switch actually physical safety switch on your brake pedal as well the vac pipe here actually tees off and goes to your, your switch on your brake pedal and you have to get this with the kit and when you press your brake pedal it actually physically opens the valve and dumps the air out so even if the computer failed to dump the air and knock the cruise off basically knock the throttle back to, to naught at least your foot on your pedal is going to physically dump the air out of this so it's two ways and you can get all that all, that, all this is off of Granada but it's on most cars. I managed to take the switch off the scrap Granada I got this stuff from. So that's good. So that we don't need it for this demonstration, but it does dump physical brake switch combined with an electrical set of contacts as well. Not only does it check that the bulb's on, but it wants to see that you've fitted that physical switch. And one of them is permanently on 12. That's the actual physical switch. I just took explain the safety switch is always on 12 so that breaks and the brake lamp is always off 12 and goes on to 12 so these work opposite to each other that's again combines it into a safety feature so to get the ECU to work on the bench here I'm just going to connect 12 volts straight to the safety input not have it on a switch because I'm it's no point setting it up so just connect 12 volts straight to that wire so that it's it's always thinks your brake pedals open in this, well, it's closed, but you push the pedal and it goes open. So that's just, that safety line will activate it ourselves, but we'll, we will fit it into the car. But for now, that safety feature will just override it by permanently wiring it to the 12, so it thinks all's okay on the brake switch. Here, we'll connect a physical bulb up to the circuit because we need that. It measures the resistance, as I said, and that is it. So. What we do now is put the ECU on the bench, get all these cables, what we've got a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's eight wires we need to think about plus a ground, so nine if you're grounding the unit, and ten because we need 12 volts to the unit. So we'll connect 12 volts to the ECU, we'll connect the switch switches here to it, we'll connect the safety override on and put it onto 12 volts, we'll just loop that across to the 12 We'll connect a speed input, which I've got a simulator on the bench, I'll show you that in a sec. We'll connect the motor up, and then by pressing one of the switches, as long as my speed is at the correct speed, that is over 35 mile an hour, which we just have to guess what that ends up being. You just trial and error it on the speed simulator on the bench, because it's not done in mile per hour. My speed simulator is more, his frequency is done in hertz. But the Hertz equates to the speed. Faster you're going, faster the pulses. Hertz is how many times per second something happens. So if I tap my pen on this bench now, that's two times a second, so I'm at two Hertz. Well, actually, there's a bit of a, a longer break between that. It would more be like this. If you did this, that's a different kind of waveform. That's a double 
then a longer pause that's just different kind of waveform so what you've got they're just waveforms and how waveforms happen that's done frequency mark space ratio and stuff it's not really needed for what we're doing here this is a nice constant click 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 faster you go and it's going to be so quick you actually physically wouldn't hear it but you see it on a screen because we've got a, a screen wired up that can visually represent this fast pulsing of 12 volts and display it on a screen down to like thousands of times a second it can i can set the uh, the sensitivity and we can see things that are happening really quick so if you had um, to test your speed sensor on the bench with a, put it on electric drill or whatever you can put this piece of equipment that monitors it and shows you it a slow down version of it, it basically slows everything down so the screen will display it's called an oscilloscope and it can be used for all sorts of things that's it so for testing I've got what's called a square wave generator SWG. It's a piece of kit that goes on the bench and creates that. Otherwise, I'm going to have to get an electric drill and the actual speed sensor off the gearbox, put it in the drill, and start spinning the drill up to create this the speed signal. We don't want to do that. We just use this piece of kit we have on the bench, which will do the same, exactly the same thing. So I'll get the wire out of that, whack it into the ECU. Once everything's running, we should be able to hit the set button, and we'll hear the motor pull the bellows in. And then as I turn the dial on my SWG, square wave generator, it's actually a multifunction generator, but we'll call it a square wave multifunction because it does other types of things as well, but we're only using it on the square wave setting. So we'll turn the dial and the speed will increase or decrease. And the computer will then try and compensate. It'll think the car's either slowing or accelerating. I need to make adjustments to the throttle because he's asked me to set the speed at 62 miles an hour for example and it will try and do that by looking at this looking at the speed it actually doesn't know the actual speed it just knows the speed that you press the button at so that could be that could be coming out at 60 hertz 60 times a second or whatever and that happens to equate to the miles and they're not calibrated to miles it doesn't see it that way it sees it as what speed you currently what speed is coming out there the wheel sensor not the actual physical speed of the car and then it'll keep the car at that speed to create that waveform so it looks for that shape and if it can't see that shape it'll move these bellows till that shape is exact so here's an example of two different shapes of waveform i'm talking about frequencies of them really let's say that's 60 hertz this would be 120 hertz much smaller breaks in between so that'd be 120 and that might be the difference between uh, 62 mile an hour and 70 mile an hour that's how much difference there could be in the car's speed so it will look it will think that's not the right shape i'm looking for that shape which happens to be 62 mile an hour on this car depending on the gear ratios and stuff it doesn't matter and it will move the bellows till this starts to stretch out and get the same shape as that and when it sees that shape exact it won't actually physically look at it of course it measures it but this is trying to explain it that way you know so it would then adjust these and then there would be a point where they don't move anymore and unless your car slowly accelerates or decelerates you'd hear a little tiny clicking as it keeps in in its feedback loop that's it i hope i explained that in a reasonable way we're now going to go on to the bench where i've got it mocked up right here we are on the bench and in the middle is the unit itself, a 5GA004-39718 Heller cruise control unit, in this case software matched for Land Rover. That's just the actual profile of the car. The software chip works almost the same across all different models, but some might be V6, some might be V8, some may respond in different ways, so the curve, the operating parameters of the chip would be different. Like some cars might want you to boot it right down to start approaching the speed. Some might want a gradual acceleration up. For us, it doesn't really matter. Um, the car will get there no matter what. It's just it, it may surge or it may it may go flat out at first. Though I've used the same model on Ruby and it works perfect. So because of that, I'm assuming the software is the same. If it's not, it's on a plug, and then I can get these for 25 quid. So it ain't a big deal. We could always try a different unit, but it'll work. 
but it could be more refined to match a four cylinder engine. We don't know, but all I'm telling you is that uh, my other one was uh, a similar unit. Um, so we'll have to see if this behaves the same way. To the right of it is the vac pump. There's the vac pipe and it's going to the bellows just there. You can just see, let's move that bag out of the way, get things a bit clearer. Move this out of the way, helicopter going over, sounds like a Chinook, no. And what that is. Vac pump. Bellows. Cruise unit. Here I've built, rather than trying to touch wires together to simulate the switches on your steering column, I've, I've built this box. The brake light is there. So now it simulates the brake light. And then I've got my two set and resume buttons here. Saves a lot of messing around ticking the wires. So you can see that this breakout box, test box, is spliced into the loom there. 12 volt speed going into it and then the, just the two control wires here. That's it. The speed inputs coming in from this unit, which is the square wave generator. And that is set <coughs> to produce a waveform similar to that of a vehicle speed sensor. I'll bring the camera closer to that in a sec. We might be able to zoom you in, but I'm going to hand, bring you in by hand. So that is our speed. This is optional. It's just so I can monitor the waveform. We don't actually have to have the scope on it today to test it. It would work without, but it gives me a visual indication that it's the computer is seeing the speed input. 12 volts is coming in on some flying leads just at the bottom of your screen. And then we've got ground going to the unit at 12 volts. There's a little wire here, and that's the safety wire. I've got that wire permanently onto 12, so it thinks everything's safe, but that would normally be on a secondary brake switch. You have two brake switches. Your normal car one for your rear tail lights, which it monitors to, and the cruise's own brake switch, it has to, which has the, the vacuum, physical vacuum dump, which would actually effectively disconnect this hose. So I press the brake pedal, it disconnects that hose with a little valve inside, so you have to put the T-piece here coming off it to your, to your brake pedal. Everything's on. We've got a speed control here. This will simulate the speed. So all I'm going to do is set that, and you need to look at the bellows, but don't worry, just on this take, we'll bring you right into the bellows in a minute off, off the tripod. So let's get you there. Press and set. Okay, so you heard that go, and it pulled them bellows in, and now pulled in, look, and they've locked in that place. Whoops, and guess what? I've just disconnected the neutral cable, you idiot. Not that it really matters. Let's start again. Clipped on, crop clipped on. Start again. Set that. Okay, so it pulled in the bellows. You hear the motor going, and now it's reached the speed that I set it at. Because I'm not altering the speed there, it thinks that's great nice and steady. As I drift the car in and out, as the loading changes, this and out tries to fight back. A, a battle between the back and the back dump. Because I'm, this is equivalent to me violently slowing the car down, although obviously you couldn't use your brake pedal to slow it down. This is a hill. This is a hill climb now. As it puts, puts boots the throttle to get you up the hill and then as you coast down the hill it speeds up and it'll drop it'll click it right back out I'm speeding up I'm speeding up it's dropping off the revs I'm still speeding up it's almost no revs needed because I've speeded up now I've gone on the level and I'm losing speed so it's pulling back to bring the speed back in and all this would be done in much less movement than this. It's very exaggerated. Now I press my foot on the brake pedal and it knocks it all out. Gone. Until we, until we restart. Locks the speed on. It's happy. You hear the odd click. There'll be a little bit of drift on even on my kit. You can hear that. It's slowly backing the speed off. You hear the clicks. Bring it back in. You can almost get it to stay where you want. If you set a new speed, 
when you do. Right, so we can coast and resume, there's coast, so that turns it off. Resume will take it back to where it was, just about there. Lock out, coast, go back to my speed, locks it where it was, brakes on, loses it. Off the roundabout, back onto the dual kaiju, wherever we're going, resume. It always lands in the same place on the bells. Let's take you down now, show you that working. Okay, that's the little junction of cables. 12 in, some grounds, my signal, speed signal in, and then a monitoring cable which refers to the scope screen. There you can see the waveform that we talked about there on the screen. Look, as I increase the speed, the waveform changes, the clicks get faster or slower depending, slowing down, speeding up. Your camera sees it differently because of the way that video video systems work and display this but you can see that that's just the speed I've marked the range in which it appears to work on the dial there and the, the frequency range and it seems to be happier so in that range it's probably that's probably 40 to 80 mile an hour depending on what they want you to run the cruise at I don't know if you can do cruise at like 100 mile an hour I'm not sure anyway that doesn't matter there's the little switch box it just makes life easy so you don't have to be touching the 12 volts onto the steering column buttons there's the vac pump so a vac line that's where it dumps the air or lets the air in a little valve opens inside and it just sucks the air back in and then there's the bellows and they work like that I just vacuum pulls on the speedo cable you can see and that sets your speed so if I go over here in my left hand now I'm going to set it and you'll see the bellows go in and then lock to the speed now by controlling the speed here I get it to go where I want and it's happy that it's found the speed that you just set it at from time to time it will try and compensate quite happy there it thinks it wants to go a bit faster look so increase speed to see that it's done its job and then it drops back I probably oversped it Hard for me to do it with this piece of kit, but we can get something like close. It'd be much, much more gradual. You could never, I can accelerate from 0 to 60 on this in like, you know, milliseconds. Well, you just wouldn't do that on the road. You've got to get the road, wheels rolling, of course. And that's it. So this unit works off eBay, 25 quid. I'd already built this for Ruby. It just comes in. We wire this multi harness into the actual base of this so that you can diagnose it on the car or take it off and check it on the bench if there's any faults that's the cruise control that's all you have to do this vac pump normally goes in the engine bay for me I fit it in the boot but not visible in the boot in a sort of hidden area near the parcel shelf at the back of the car and we insulate it it's on rubber cups anyway there but uh, we put some insulating round sound padding around it then I, I run the vac line down the headlining channel, the roof gut gutter channel inside the car and it comes out. This sits just in front of the speedo, actually just in this area, look, just around that area there on the A panel inner. And it all works and that keeps the cable at a straight line of sight straight to the carburetor. So no kinks in the cable, it's a perfect position and it works, comes with its little mounting bracket. Ford Granada that is. I think it's Mark III Granada. This is not Ford, this is at eBay. The Ford one would be all part of this, but the Ford one wants more information. Here's the schematics for the Ford one, and it just wants too much info, which is not overkill for what we want. I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, it wanted all sorts of stuff, and it's a bigger unit with a bigger plug on it and it wasn't basic enough for what we need so it was too good really the Ford one 
I'm trying to remember there was a caveat that just writ it off completely and I thought no way that won't work it needed something and I can't remember what so cruise control is up and cruise control is running and the video itself is a lot shorter than I anticipated therefore may well be included as Christmas bonus footage at the end of this tech vid and you've just seen me going on about calendars if indeed this is in ignore if not and then you get to see the cruise which you are going to expect to see on another film so we've we'll give you a little Christmas goodie I hope downloaded a diagram from um, the website from the internet okay that's from Ruby Days I already had this in stock shows the uh, inputs there looks a bit more complex on here because they're showing stuff like an interrupt switch on you if you're automatic an interrupt switch so that cruise will only happen if you're in drive position so I, I have to fit a little sensor on the gearbox uh, t-shifter micro switch so that it's only active in drive this is all controlled by my stalk and then the stalk wires all come out here so three pairs set resume coast and then the actual off on push back on the stalk to actually physically kill it dead kill its 12 volt feed that's another backup if something's going wrong even though you press your brake and something even not working hit that and it, there'll be no power to it at all so it's got three safety features 12 volt total kill a brake line sensor on your brake bulbs and the vac t piece vac dump and safety switch as well so there's loads of safety on it they certainly made sure of that but the only thing that could go wrong is the throttle cable itself could stick if you don't come up with a good foolproof way of connecting it to the carburetor which when i do that i'll show you how i did it quite quite easy really so we've seen the circuit diagram we've seen the test equipment We've gone through different speed settings and watched the bellows operate. We'll do it one more time, close up this time. Almost got a speed block. And that's it. Knock it out. Gone. Well, I hope that's uh, enjoyable for you. Just showing you how Cruise works. All we have to do now is go and get it integrated into our loom make sure we get an individual fuse supply for that system and that we wire wrap neatly now and make some good connectors and uh, neaten it all up now that we've proved the theory and the units working the fact that it fired up straight away is always a good sign usually you pull something out of a box and it just works straight away the odds are it's, it's stood being chucked about a bit it's going to be okay <clears throat> always worries me if you boot it up and then it only works after it's got warm and that means you're gonna have dry joints and stuff I've had that in the past these are renowned for being unreliable believe it or not I say that if they've done all this but that's only because they suffer from dry solder joints that's where the parts inside are soldered into the circuit board and the solder over time breaks away and these have a resin coat so I dip these I've not done it with this one but I've done them in the past on Ruby the backup ones on Ruby because I've got two, one spare. Both of those, I dipped them in thinners and it dissolved all that um, sealant stuff, lacquer and resin. And I was able to repair the solder joints. I did find a few. Never had a problem since. You can reflow solder them. Heat gun's good for that as well. You can turn the board over, very careful with your heat gun as you just see the solder start to melt, then lay back. Be really careful, bit of a gamble, but if it's broken, there's nothing to lose. You can do that and i had a faulty one which i did that with and it repaired it that's it we're done cruise is in on the bench working and hopefully i've explained to you how how that is and that can quite easily fit into project bramble just a question of neating up the wires but we'll leave that for the next episode 
I'm presuming this is tagged on at the end. If not, then it's part of another film. And we're lost in space. Catch you soon. Just finished the cruise control and we, we thought it was a wrap until we realised we need torque converter lockup control module building. And we may as well include that footage just straight after the cruise footage, just when you thought it was safe to go out. And we'll put, we'll put that out for Christmas day after Boxing Day perhaps. You may only get a couple of hours notice as it's on the live stream, so apologies for that. But I just want to give you some bonus footage over the festivity period. May as well throw this in. Seems to be quite popular, the tech stuff. There won't be a mega amount of it left now, we're coming to the end of it. But I did realise there's one more box. <clears throat> well, there will be a couple more boxes to build. But this is one of them, one of the heavier tech involved jobs which needs to be done. And this is all about converting the torque converter lockup, excuse the pun, but torque converter lockup on the automatic gearbox. This chip's an LM2907, or its brother, the 2917. There's a slight difference between the two with a, a Z and a diode, don't worry about that. This chip, it's a little baby little chip, beautiful little chip. And Texas Instruments make it, and they make it for the... Well, it's, it's very popular in the automotive industry. You'll find it in your car, probably, in, in earlier cars anyway. Late 70s, early 80s, through to the 90s. It's still used today, but slowly being um, superseded by different types of controllers these days. But it's used for... Um, you can use it to build uh, RPM rev counters, digital rev counters. You can build it to do the desk circuit for a rev counter. You can use it to for uh, it's used in ABS braking system circuits. It's used to uh, convert the speed of a frequency, a spinning wheel, for example, to a voltage, so you get a deflection on the gauge. It's used for all sorts of pulse counting applications, all to do with measuring speed on sensors. But it's a custom designed chip, it does half the work for you already inside the chip, that's what, and that's why they're called integrated circuits or chips. An integrated circuit is really just what all, all what we've been building on the, the little ferro board, the uh, soldering board, all condense into one miniature circuit contained within a chip, which then forms the building block to create a more complex system. So chips are all different, every chip's got a different internal every series anyway of course not if they're all the same number they're all the same but each chip can be used for different applications you've seen us use those 4017 decade counting chips for counting pulses and creating time loops and time delays for the wipers this is a little bit more sophisticated or a little bit more how, how would I want to say it's not as digital if you will this to do with taking inputs and switching them under certain conditions, under certain rotational speeds, under certain voltage conditions. It's called, as I said, a 2907 or a 2917. There's a slight difference between them. One's more stable in, in cars. So we're going to look at that now. And the classic back of an envelope sketch for me to, to knock this circuit together. I ran out of paper, so we use an old envelope. Hold on while I said it is! Oh my god! <coughs> A classic back of the envelope situation was as I sketch out roughly how I want to customise my chip into the circuit to do this torque converter lockup. But we're going to have to first ask ourselves what is torque converter lockup and why do we need it? Going over here, let's just have a little walk across and get you away from that bench for a while, rest your eyes as we get slowly head back to the mechanical side of the build. Underneath there's the rebuilt A4 gearbox. That's a Ford Granada, or it was also in the Sierra. What's called an A4LDE gearbox. There's two types of E gearbox. One's fully computerized and one's semi computerized. This is sort of semi electronic in that the um, kick down's electric. There's a little solenoid. You can just see the solenoid at the edge of the gearbox just there. It's electronic kick down, so we need a micro switch on the end of our rev on our accelerator pedal to operate the kick down and a relay to control it as well because it's twin coil kick down a heavy coil brings in most of the work then a lighter loaded coil holds it in the kick down position 
that's to stop it getting too hot. If you use the main windings of the coil to hold the kick down in, it would get hot if you kept your foot down. So they have a secondary winding, much lighter, once the main work's been done, when it pulls the kick down lever, it can hold with a much smaller holding current. So that's why they do it, it stops it getting hot. But that gearbox has a torque converter on it, as it's automatic, of course. And that torque converter has, for economy reasons, what's called a torque converter lockup. Uh, it was re it was a newer thing. 70s cars tended not to have lockup, although correct me if I'm wrong on that. And then we'll get, I'll get the whiteboard and I'll talk about the torque converter lockup and why we need this module that we've built to control it. Okay, the whiteboard is out again. We find it comes in pretty handy for you at home, even though I don't know which way around it is. When, in, when I look in the viewfinder, I keep saying something's left and it's not, and it's right and it's left and it's right and it's not left. Okay, T, C, lock. Okay, you've got your gearbox, you've got your output shaft, you've got your prop shaft, you've got your speed sensor just in the tail section. That's the sensor which creates these pulses shaped like this. We've talked about them going to be used for the cruise, going to be used for this lockup converter. Here uh, in the bell housing, just inside there's your torque converter fitted into there, bolts onto the flex plate on the engine itself. Spins round as torque converters do. I'm not going to explain the exact workings of a torque converter, but suffice to say on the side of the gearbox is a little two pin connector so you've got two wires coming off it and they're the wires that switch the torque converter lock up on what is it? well what they like to do is create a direct drive from the engine to the output shaft almost direct drive right away through to your engine so you actually eliminate the torque converter the torque converter is full <coughs> filled with fluid and the way that they work there's, an, there's two impellers inside stators, some fluid inside the torque converter, all slushes about. Imagine sticking your, uh, uh, imagine sticking a, a spoon in some ice cream that's just beginning to melt, it's all slushy. As you spin that spoon round, you start to drag the tub round with it, but if you were to grab hold of the tub, you'd still be able to be continuing to stir your spoon round in the tub, okay? Well, that idea, that effect of viscosity, I know it's a crude explanation, but my engine output here can spin around freely with the, this locked with the uh, wheel station, the car brakes on, and it doesn't stall the engine because it slushes round in that fluid. As soon as you let go, it starts to gain speed and starts to spin the torque converter up. So it creates a viscous coupling between the engine and the gearbox so you don't stall your car. That's, that's a very 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 just touching the, the outer knowledge of torque converters and auto boxes we don't really need to discuss that because you're probably more knowledgeable than me about that torque converter but that's how it was always done when you're cruising uh, you always get a little bit of slippage on here the nature of the fact that it's that fluid you never get that direct drive so if i was doing constant miles on the motorway 70 mile an hour for example um, you, you've always got a little bit of slippage going on, so you're losing a little bit of economy there. And it's the main reason they have lockup was economy. Can be used for other applications. Sometimes the the drag car racers use it for setting off quicker and things. There's a few little tweaks you can do, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that. They did it primarily to achieve MPG, and indeed on the A4 LD box, it can equate to almost the same as a um, a Type 9 in economy. Type 9 is the uh, Sierra 5 speed gearbox which you can fit to a Cortina because they, they fit on Pinto engines. So an A4LD with a lockup activated can give you almost the same fuel economy as a Type 9 manual gearbox. So that, that addressed the issues where people didn't like autos because they were uneconomical. You'll never get it exactly the same because this isn't always engaged, this lockup all the time. But when you're into your cruising motorway miles, that's when it starts to catch up with a Type 9. Round town, you'll not do it. But on a, on a long distance driving, with this lockup engaged, 
with a one-on-one -on -one drive, no torque converter. It's going straight through the car. It's locked solid. It eliminates the torque converter, so you can cruise and not have that around that 10% loss power in that torque converter. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I'm going into the realms of mechanics, which I'm not an expert on, but I've genned up a little bit on it. Okay, so I do apologise if this isn't factually correct. It's probably not far off the principle anyway. E for electronic on the A4LD. By the way, there was a fully manual, very early and very rare A4LD without the electronic lockup, and they manually engaged it. But ours is the semi-electronic one. And then there's a third one, which was the, the overdrive gear itself was controlled also by the computer. So you'd have um, two plugs on it, or three pin plug whereby the computer would tell it to go to the overdrive gear and control the lockup. That way you could have what's called sport mode or icy slippage mode, a little symbol of a snowflake on it. But ours is not that one, it's just the, the mid, midway A4L D, and I think they did it by a small D, a capital D, denoted which one, and then an E at the end for electronic. Quick overview there of what we've got on Project Bramble. This type gearbox with this torque converter with the lockup. So the lockup works by, there's a little solenoid inside here and then there's some grab plates inside the torque converter. It opens a little channel and fluid can get in and force open these little grab, grab um, claws or whatever they, however they've done it, pressure plate, but it effectively locks it so it's no longer spinning in that, um, that cup, cup of ice cream we talked about where you could slush it around. It makes that solid so I'm now completely turning the whole thing round no more fluid going on. Switch it off, turn off the power to the 12 volts and it becomes back to the torque converter. So if you're pulling up to the lights and coming stationary, you don't want this on because you'd stall your engine because you'd be solidly locked. Although I do believe that the gearbox actually overcomes that in a hydraulic valve sense. I don't think that's actually possible to do, but in theory, if you didn't t turn your lockup um, lock solenoid off when you got to the traffic lights, you would stall your car because you'd have no torque converter. It'd just be like being in first gear <coughs> or fourth gear, whatever, and in, in in your manual car, not pressing the clutch in until you, you just stall. So it has to be controlled at the right point. And it seems to be that the going rate is 45 mile an hour to, to bring it online. But only when you're in drive. You don't want to bring the, the lockup on when you're in any other gear. Uh, it's designed to work, in this case, on cruising conditions or near cruising conditions so you really want to be in position D on your T-shifter for the torque converter to be allowed to come online so position D on your T-shift, your T-shift stick okay so we'd have to fit a micro switch then because it doesn't come with it on the Cortina there's the face plate T-shifter goes in like this so you're sliding up and down there we want a micro switch around here and I've just realised I've been using the wrong pen for me white bullet. This ain't coming off. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, oh, finish time. Oh, bugger. I've used the wrong pen. I broke the old train of thought. I've used the wrong pen. I thought, I thought the fumes were getting a bit... No. Oh no. We'll get this off with finish after. Sorry. T-shifter will need a micro switch to tell it it's in the drive position, okay? Uh, because we don't have that. Although I think you can get the later gearbox has a, like a multi-switch on the side of the gearbox selector housing outside the box. I might look at a scrapyard to get one of them. If not, we've got to build a micro switch on position D. We need that for the cruise anyway, because cruise also only comes on in position D. So we're going to have, <coughs> excuse me again, we're going to have a micro switch here. That's part of the element of this design we're about to do. So it's going to not come on when you're in D. I don't want it coming on when my foot's on the brake either. So we've got a brake pedal switch as well as an element here. So brakes on, torque converter lockup will drop out. Any position other than D, it won't be active. So we've effectively got a switch what's called a string of events that have to all happen together. So one switch has to be closed, goes through a second switch which also has to be closed in order to get, <coughs> in order to allow 
the current to get to this solenoid, this 12 volt solenoid here that will open the gate for the valve, let fluid in and create force on these lockup plates and lock the system up. So we've got that brake pedal, position D on the stick and also we need it to be at the right speed of 45 mile an hour. So any one of those braking will knock it out and that's called a string so each switch has to go through the neck so they all have to be closed. So we need a speed switch there, we need the, the uh, drive position switch and we need the brake switch. To get the brake switch we don't want to interfere with the car's wiring in, in terms of uh, interrupting the brake pedal bulb and stuff like that. So what we do we just get a relay and the relay will create that contact inside the relay and the relay then connects to the brake bulb. So you're not interfering with your brake line circuit. So brake bulb comes on, activates the relay and then the relay will close the switch. So the relay will isolate us away from the circuit. So that's the brake dead easy to do. Just get a relay connected to the brake 12 volt switch. That will close and that will close our position one, two and three conditions. Brake's done. Drive, again, I'll have to fit a micro switch to the T-shifter. I'll have to find a way of doing it. I think I've done it on, yeah, I've done it on Project Ruby. So we just have to, a little micro switch, something like this. I'm going to grab it out of stores. Hold on, bear with me. It'll be something like this. I'm grabbing it now. Trying to keep your board steady, trying to keep you entertained at home. Technical stuff. Little switch here, look. So that can be placed somewhere on the drive position to get it to activate only when in drive. That would, that would fix that switch. Then here's a tricky part and that's what the module is on the bench with this 2907 stroke 2917 chip. A 45 mile an hour speed switch. We want it to come in at 45 and close. So brakes, this actually would be wired the opposite way this relay. You'd actually have it closed and open when you press brakes. So that's normally closed. Brakes would open it, so you'd use the other set of contacts. You'd need a relay that's got the, the changeover contacts on, not the, just a normal close-only type. It's the uh, flip-over relay. Not a double pole, just a single pole changeover relay. So that would normally be closed. Brakes gone, then it'd break it open as the brakes go on. D, again, the same idea. When it's in D, it's joined up. We get to this. As long as those two conditions are satisfied and we're over 45 mile an hour, we'll get the module to switch a relay on, which will then send 12 volts to the solenoid, <clears throat> as long as we stay over 45, all the way up to the top speed of the car. It doesn't drop out at a max speed, I don't think, so it's 45 all the way, so our max speed, um, around 110 mile an hour on the car. <clears throat> I've took Bramble up to... Robbie Ruby up to 105. I don't like going over 80 mile an hour, you know that. It's against the law in most countries anyway. So in fear, we've been on the autobahn with Ruby and took it up to the max speed. There's nowhere else in the country you can do that except a private test track. So the UK speed limit is 70 mile an hour. There's our caveat. So um, that can stay on. So as soon as you drop below 45, it's got to cut out and drop that lock out. But what you don't want is when you're at 44.9 mile an hour dropping out and then going to 45 and dropping in because that's called hysteresis, that's the switching point. It'll, it'll cause what's called chatter on the relay. So the relay will be going click, 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 click. When you're around that sensitive 44.9 to 45 mile an hour area, your relay's going to be going like this. So you're building some hysteresis uh, which is the, the zone of switching. Your wall on your thermostat at home has got hysteresis. Think about it when you turn the old school thermostat anyway before digital thermostats. When you turn that stat on the wall of your house you hear it click but then as you turn it back it takes a little longer to click back on, off or whichever way it was. That's the range or the hysteresis of operation. My thermostat at home, I turn it, clicks but then when I turn it right back to the point where it just clicked it doesn't until you come a little bit further back so you've got that operating zone and that's what we've got to build into this speed controller an operating window of where our speed is so I would go over 45 this would come on as long as these conditions are met with those switches 
I drop back say to 30 before it drops out or 40 mile an hour before it clicks back out. So then when I'm drifting between 45 and 40, that's the operation and anywhere over 45, it's gonna stay engaged. So that's, how, that's what we have to do. That box here that controls this, that box, that module there, that module's gonna need wires coming into it from that, that T-shifter selector. It's gonna need wires coming into it from the relay when I activate the brake pedal. It'll need a wire coming into it off that shaft sensor to sense this square wave we talked about. So it's, it's got to look at the speed. It's got to look at these switches here. And we've got to have that zone of operation built into it. Okay. And as a double measure, not only when we go bet between 45 and 40, let's say we choose those, but we're going to make it adjustable so we can adjust the cutting points of the cruise lockup, of the torque converter lockup. So I can actually have a little, what's called a part or a potentiometer or a variable resistor. I turn it with a little watchmaker screwdriver and I can adjust my range so I can go out in the car and calibrate it exact how I want. But not only that, but it also must have a, a facility that if the sensor gives any spurious information or fails or goes crazy and or you get interference or any kind of electrical problem if for example the alternator went haywire and really what I'm saying is if you've got crazy information coming in here you don't want to falsely trigger this so I have seen it where you can get spikes electrical spikes and you get like a quick spike of electric and it can fool this that it's actually doing 70 mile an hour or whatever well we build a second level of hysteresis in where it has to be constantly happy with a smooth signal from a, a measured amount of time so we could make it 20 seconds so it would only say right i'm happy with the output everything's nice and steady for 20 seconds all these are switched i'm over 45 mile an hour there's no spikes or anything coming in everything seems steady now activate so that's a second level on top of the chip on top of the 2917 we're going to add a triple five that's our off the shelf lovely little timer we're going to do it in what's called one shot monostable operation which just once it's on it locks on till the power's off that's an extra little level of, of safety so i'm now going to take you to the bench that was the explanation the best that i could do it i'm going to need some thinners to get all this off because i've used a blooming permanent pen on the whiteboard done both on the bench i'll show you what i've got set up board is clean we're good to go. Come down on the bench with me now. And I'll show you the module. There it is. You can just see it coming into shot. And we're going to talk you through the kit. I'm going to demo it up and running. Then I'm going to open up the can of worms inside because it is tightly packed in there. Okay, everything's on. I've got 12 volts connected to my module. Don't worry, we're going to open it up and show you inside in a minute. We've got the oscilloscope to help us, just so we can see that we're getting um, the speed sensor input from the spinning shaft of the, the A4 box, the little sensor. I'll show you that in a minute. But we're fooling the whole system that the uh, engine's spinning around, that the, sorry, the gearbox is spinning around by using this simulator. All this does is simulates the road speed. Don't worry about it other than that. It's actually called a uh, signal generator. You can use it for all sorts. Today we're using it like we just did on the cruise control to simulate the road speed sensor. We're sharing the speed sensor between crews and this unit. You can do that. The signal's strong enough to share between different modules. You could share between your trip computer, your dashboard uh, speedometer, your cruise control, other items that the car monitors. It may be ABS, I don't know. It can, it can connect to various modules. The um, the uh, speed signal um, sensor on the back that bolts on the back of your gearbox there. A lot, most cars have them nowadays anyway. So the scope is set to monitor the, what we call that square wave. You can see it's a square wave shape. I can measure the alter the monitoring speed. Although it's set there, so we can see it. And this dial here, this the famous knob. Um, that always opens up for jokes, doesn't it? So we can turn this and that simulates the, the shaft of the gearbox. Knobs and shafts getting faster. And lots of holes to put them in. 
this can go faster which increases the speed of the 12 volts so remember we talked about this all that's doing is going 12 12 12 12 and as I turn that 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, really fast okay and it's not actually 12 it's a signal 2 volts but it doesn't need to be 12 for what we're doing in real life the output of the sensor I've got one here hang on it's in the end of the drill we'll see why it's in the end of the drill in a minute that sensor there actually on its wires this is what you actually got on your cars at home folks there's the cogs that fit into the back output shaft of the auto box or even the manual box the same three wires 12 volts ground and then the the 12 12 12 12 output as it spins faster 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 12 volt pulses but they're actually 9 volt on this it actually doesn't quite do 12 it doesn't need to actually okay I'll show you that in a minute why I've got that in the drill so that what you just saw is just that without a drill attached this makes life easier for me so that signal is now being fed on the yellow wire into my this is my switching module here in my hand I'm going to bring that up to screen chill style there we have it we've got three lights on it one is counting letting us know that it's receiving pulses from the speed sensor so that's currently red at the moment because it's receiving pulses it's going to start to blink as I go down can you see a slow blink let's bring you up I'll have to hook around the lamp bring you right in so you can see we've got a flashing red light showing the pulses of the road that's effectively the, the shaft spinning around on the auto box a green light there that's what's called the safety light greens on and the systems offline then above it is another red light which would indicate the torque converter lockup so that red light connects to the actual main relay outside of this box can be fitted behind the dash that relay will click and give the 12 volt signal that we need to the gearbox to to open that solenoid inside the gearbox which opens the fluid to go into the lockup plates and locks up so once that's red the gearbox is locked up so we need that to be red when we hit 45 mile an hour we need the safety to go out and then when we come down to around 40 we want that to go off safety to stay on the flash is just getting slower and slower that's what we've built so I'm going to increase the speed I'll again bring it closer to the screen my other hand will be on the speed control knob and we'll increase speed and you'll see this slowly flash faster till you can't see it any quicker and then what will happen is the green will start to die out as the safety feature falls away and we approach the target speed of around 45 mile an hour and we'll, we'll get a click out now I, I just heard the first click now you've got that second time delay to make sure everything's stable and on we go it was happy with everything it was happy with the speed you can see just about on your screen the waveforms change shape look look how it changes shape as we go slower and slower can you see that it's more stretched there's less pulses in a given time frame across the square wave changes the frequency it's faster and faster and faster so the, the pulses there's much more bang for your buck on the screen you see for there look we've got one per second so that's one hertz coming in at one per second one 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 which would be dead your car would be rolling down like half a mile an hour there and as I increase it look how many now we're getting four per second so four 12 volt pulses per second bang for buck all the way till you get to up to these speeds 10 Hertz that's thousands per second and the box responds accordingly so marked on the knob are the operating parameters of the speed I know that that's 30 mile an hour, I know that's 70, I know that because of my cruise control days because we've measured in real, ter real terms, in real time, going out in the car what this Ford sensors ran at, now there was no tech data available so I didn't know that 10 times a second on the flashes meant 10 mile an hour, it's not correlated that way you have to go out and physically find the correlation and I've done it and marked it on here so I know that around that area is between 40 and 70 mile an hour simulating and that's it so that's what we knew we knew that from the cruise control days 
the cruise also works similar in that that needs a minimum speed to come online as well but that's got its own whole operating system of course we know that but there we are so we're actually locked up the light, light is on because you can see we're just over the 40 mile an hour well it's actually dropped because remember the hysteresis let's turn it off <clears throat> it'll come on later than it goes off so we're going we're to bring it online G green safety light's gone out it now pauses on it goes it's happy with a constant stream and there's no interference now <clears throat> the point where it locked on i've now gone beyond it and it's still not dropped out because of that that level it's coming up to it now around uh, 38 and it's out now i can adjust that range down to a couple of mile an hour by putting in the screwdriver just into this little operating slot here and there's a little tiny adjuster and I turn it just to fine tune where I want it to work. So that's going at the moment. Here's all the wires coming out on a Molex that I've built. And this looks like there's loads, but there's not. The yellow wire there is the speed sensor input. A pair of greens, that's that string of switches we talked about. That'll go through the drive switch and that'll go through the, the brake relay. So when I press the brake relay, it'll disconnect them two wires, as will the drive switch. And that, as you can see, kills the circuit. Let's bring it up to speed. Flat out, I'm at 80 mile an hour. So nothing's happening yet because it takes a while to kick in. It's kicked in. Now when I break the green wires, which would effectively be the drive, going out of position drive or pressing the brake pedal, gone. And now when I, when I press release the brake pedal, you don't want it, I don't want to be stamping on my brake pedal and clicking this, click, 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 click. So it uses that same timer that second timer in conjunction with this pedal so now when i've let my foot off the brakes it takes a while to come back online that stops it i don't want to be able to sit I'll, if i just tap the brakes lightly on the motorway just if you uh, someone's pulled cut you up or something and you're just tapping your brake at 70 you're not dropping your speed anything like below 70 you might just drop slightly down to 68 but you don't want this clicking off and on as i press the brake pedal because it's ready to, to click off and on because we're over the speed of 45. So but you still need it to have a delay for when I'm pressing off and on my brake pedal to stop that chatter, which I've just separated it again, it'll come on in a sec. That's a second level of control. So you can't click, 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 click on that brake pedal and uh, what's called chatter the relay because I don't want to be having them lock up plates going like it might damage them you know I don't really know how it works so we just want it gentle so it's got a second level timer in it so that's that's the drive and brake switch pairs dead simple that's two of the wires covered we've only got a few more left red's 12 volts there's three wires like I said about the speed sensor that's four wires so it's not that complicated then one extra pair look here that, that creates all the wires for it this extra pair this is actually the 12 volts to the gearbox or the relay what you do so that it's on a separate fuse and that you're not using the fuse off the controller you all it's always prudent to have different circuits fused independently so i could just have had one single 12 volt output wire on this going to the solenoid on the gearbox but that would mean if the fuse blew for this and the gearbox goes off it don't really matter because this is the only thing that's controlling that solenoid but it's not a, it's better to have the gearbox solenoid independently fused not the fuse off this that way if the gearbox uh, solenoid developed a fault and it was kept blowing this fuse you'd know that the fault was the gearbox solenoid and not the fuse on this if this developed a fault and blew its fuse and that this was deriving its power from that box you wouldn't know if it was the gearbox that was popping the fuse or this module so by keeping the, the supply independent 12 volts in if the box says yes 12 volts out then go to the solenoid because there's a little relay in here but we, we're actually going to use it to trigger a secondary relay this has got the relay for this but only a very light duty one that's called a slave relay which is going to trigger the larger relay which then feeds the feed to the um, the box so in that respect you could have had just a single 12 output but I did it this way for safety 
okay because the 12 volts going into this will supply to the relay but the same 12 volt feed will um, come off the main relay into the box okay that's it so to summarize that the little tiny relay that comes on with this red light does not directly activate the lockup solenoid it cl simply closes these two white wires together when all the conditions are correct those two white wires when they close together there'll be a separate relay behind me dash or it could even be bolted to the gearbox if you want we'll click on and that then fires it so that means you're keeping this isolated away on just the low current side of things that's it really so don't don't worry because there's not that many cables look you brake and drive select a switch that's for safety and then your actual output wires the rest the yellow one as I said is that speed control you can see it there and the other two are just power now let's have a look at the unit working before we open it up inside let's have a look at the unit working with a normal speed sensor off the car so in the end of the drill we can just about get up to speed with, with this um, uh, Bosch drill that I've got so the Bosch, the speed sensor needs 12 volts. So if I connect this to 12 volts on the bench is the 12 volt feed just here. I'm going to connect the sensor up. You can just see me doing it. It's a bit crude. I should use little jumper leads for this. I'm going to twist those wires together. Connect the 12 volts back to the box here. I should really use, let's just grab a, a lead just to crock them up really. I've got 12 volts to the box, 12 volts to this sensor. Now I'm going to disconnect out of the circuit my generator. I don't need it. I won't. I'll put. I'll leave the scope on. I'm going to take the signal generator out. Here it is. Here's the signal generator crock clips. Uncrock, uncrock them, and take that out of the equation. So we've now got no vehicle speed simulator on. 12 volts is going to come in. That noise is the computer fan speeding up. I've got ground to the sensor. Again, open the clip up, put the ground in. Can you still see? Yeah, you're okay, you can see that. Sensor inputs here. Blue on my sensor. It's the wrong actual colour. Doesn't matter though. I've sold the, this was a damaged sensor that I've repaired, the wires had snapped, so I've sold basically the wrong colour cables on the end, but it's only because it's for test. That is now connected in, it's got 12 volts to it, it's got ground to it, and it's going to start putting out the 9 volt, it would normally, you, 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 let's call them 12 volt pulses, they're actually 9, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 faster and faster and faster, this is going to monitor it at the moment, safety is on, there's no lockup present because we're not running our road speed. Can you just see that on the bench? Can we lock it on the bench somewhere? Yeah, I'm trying to get it so it's nice and clear. There we go. Should just be able to see these lights. I know that I should really zoom you in a little bit more, but I want you to see the scope read out. Right, connecting the scope across the blue output as well. So the oscilloscope and the the, the torque converter lockup module sharing the same input. Scope shows nothing. Move the drill, otherwise you can't see the scope. Turn the overhead light off to make it clearer. Scope can see nothing at the moment. Not reading a thing because this isn't spinning. As I start to turn this now, look straight away. Let's bring it down. You can see the pulses coming in. Look, 12, 12, 12, 12. Now it's a little bit, it's not as clean as this output in terms of that. We're talking about a square wave. This is a little bit, it's probably not set for actual pure square, but it doesn't really matter, it's still pulsing. So this still is locked out. Have we got our brake pedal closed? No, we haven't, so we needed to close that. Look, it wouldn't have come on because our brake was on and our, we weren't in drive with these two wires. So let's hook them together. Now everything's happy. We don't need to concern ourselves with the two white wires there for, for switching it on. We can tell what's happening just off the red light. So can we get up to speed with this drill? 
Okay, can you see everything there? I hope you can just see these lights. I know it's going to be small on your, on your screens at home, but I'm trying to show you a wider view. Up we go. Now you can see, I hope, this little red light picking up the pulses from the, the Ford sensor. If not, what I'll do is, I've just got enough poetic license here to do this. Yes, I can actually do it for you. You can still see the scope, you can see this. Just in case, right up. Picking up the pulses, but it's not fast enough, look. Look on the screen, it's not quick enough. That's not nowhere near the range that we want. We're going to go faster. We're going to see what happens. Okay, here we go. Let's spin right up to speed. Safety beginning to cut out. Safety out. Locked up. Slowing down. Safety coming in. Out. Come back on. Sound like it was talking to me then, singing a little tune, the drill. That's it, it works. Within the scope of the Ford sensor, so we're equivalently really driving down the road then, because that's all we would have been doing if we were driving it down the road. Yes, you're gonna have an alternator running, that, and that throws a, a separate um, question mark over it, because the alternator could well indeed fit, interfere with, that this could be very sensitive to spikes. We don't know what kind of suppression I've built, whether it's any good or not, my suppression system. It's good on the bench power supplies. Will it, will it cope with the fluctuating voltages across the battery? Now, I have put this on a variable voltage power supply and gone the hell like that, trying to spark it and do all sorts of interference and it hasn't affected it. But I know from experience, that as soon as you start connecting stuff up and you've got an alternator running and different loadings across, you can get strange things going on. So we need to make sure that the, sil the filter coming into it is, is a good clean signal here. We'll check that in real term conditions. I have put this in the footwell and driven just down the road earlier on and it seemed okay, I must admit. Plus don't forget, if it does start spiking it out, it's going to have to be spiking it out for at least 20 seconds to get past the second time level. Uh, so a quick flick on a switch or a quick spike of, say, uh, electric cooling fan cutting in or something odd like that isn't going to do it. You're going to have to be continually be interfered with for 20 seconds to lock on. So that would mean there's something wrong in the car's wiring anyway. So I think we're okay. What we're going to do, we're going to bring you in a bit closer now. I hope you can still hear me and see me. I'm just off screen there. Um, I'm going to bring you a bit closer and I'm going to have to show you the, the horror inside because this box it's so crammed inside the box right here's the back of the envelope sketch that I did based upon the schematic and data sheet I showed you earlier on in the clip on the computer screen look we have to just mock something up okay and build it so I'll give you a quick rundown in case you're electronics based I won't spend too long on this in case it gets boring um, We've got the chip itself, the beautiful Texas Instruments 2907R. Oh, wow, what a chip. Someone who made that. It, it's so rock steady. It's so bulletproof. It's so, it's so solid. It's so versatile. It's so um, flexible. It's a great piece of kit. The LM2907 or the 2917, slightly more stable version for automotive. We use the 2917. It's got a little voltage stabilizer inside it just to help with those alternator issues I just talked about. There it is. There's the speed sensor square wave input. That's just what you saw on the scope screen, although you saw it on the scope screen more like this shape, but it's the same thing. That's coming into it. It goes through a little capacitor to isolate it out. So this is never directly connected to the sensor. It's gone through like a little filter, what's called a capacitor, 
and it can't physically connect that that sort of makes a buffer zone it's this little safety feature and we've got various adjustments here to con control that switch point I talked about I'm not going to go into the electronics of those there's the adjuster there and then it comes out here and operates a uh, second timer circuit just here and that's that 20 second on time so as long as all this is happy for 20 seconds of good clean fun this clicks in down we go in fact actually that's the timer there so that clicks into that lock up relay brake relays there that's what we did that's the chip a little bit closer up a basic setup for so that's the 555 triple five what a great piece of kit 1971 then uh, I can't remember the guy that, that designed the triple five there was a reason what it was named after some said because it's oh god what was the triple five there's a reason why it's named uh, 555 and it wasn't the time I think someone just made it up there was a reason for that I, I like little details like this I'm sad that way I'm a bit of a train spotter there's a reason why it was called the 555 there's an urban myth why it was and there's a real reason forget now great eight pin chip you put power to it you put just a couple of basic parts a resistor and a capacitor that makes a little charge system that's like in water terms that's like the header tank in your loft this is like the water tap feeding the header tank the header tank slowly fills up with the water tap from this resistor tips to a certain point this says yes you're full i'm going to activate an output onto a relay then a reset pin empties the tank and it all starts again it's just great that's 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 what we use let's go inside that's, that's all I'm gonna do I'm so excited about electronics I've done electronics all my life but I love cars I love welding I love all of just travel driving electronics combining them all together <laughs> Boof. getting excited now the neurons are starting to go as we go into OCD meltdown and have a little miniature little episode We'll get all hyperactive. Sunny delight then. We're on the sunny delight. Let's open the box up and have some fun. I'm going to bring you in on the Jobby bench. Now here he is, just off screen, coming up to you, talking a bit fast. Jobby will bring you on just there so we can see right inside this because this tripod that I've got you on here won't quite, uh, it won't quite bring you in to where you want to where you want to be. And this will be the still shot once I get myself my hat straight could this be the still shot for the um, the thumbnail oops for the for the uh, cruise control episode who knows so we have to look happy right that's how we do the intro thumbnails you gotta be happy all the time get down here and have a look inside this um shall i say interesting box right now electronic hobbyists, purists and experts, forgive me. As Phil Oakey said on the song on the 1986 smash hit, Human, please forgive me. Because it's a mess inside here, but don't remember. I mean, remember, it's a prototype. And prototypes are built as you go along. We didn't have the luxury of having the circuit already designed. Or having a circuit board to solder the parts to so we use the Vero strip project board and we solder everything in but we want it in one small compact box I don't want loads of blooming boxes everywhere uh, so I'm just adjusting the light there We've got the light adjusted it's tight and that's my excuse I'm sticking to it we open up and that is jam crammed full I mean I couldn't get any more in there if I tried it's crazy now it's not as neat as I would have liked this bunch of wires is just the LEDs on the panel it was so that I could withdraw the panel a little bit further out <clears throat> but when I glue gunned I melted some of the insulation so I put a bit of tape on it there which I didn't like I might just go and heat shrink that back up put the, the lighting panel to one side here's a stack on board which is the delay relay that just wants now fixing in now we're ready <clears throat> on the flip side of that little miniature piece of here is just another that's the safety cutout relay here's the heart of it and I've left that nicely exposed in case we had to unplug it that's the chip that's the 2917 that's the beauty look at that it's on a socket so I can pull that out here is the 
second timer circuit that's the triple five timer circuit on a separate board stuffed in the side a bit of glue gun holding it in and that talks to the safety relay the safety relay comes on activates that 20 second delay we're talking about the heart of it's the baseboard at the bottom a little trim adjuster there a little trim adjuster there for our what's called our hysteresis a little drive transistor bc 108 to drive this safety relay you wouldn't you can drive straight off the chip but the way that I've done it, I've, there's an intermittent stage. The output of the chip is coming into a capacitor, charging it. The transistor measures that, flips across when the gate value goes, fires the safety relay, which then fires a 20 second delay. Just there's a regulator. I've had to chop the top off the mounting tab of the reg. Normally they have a little metal mounting tag, but it's not under heavy loading. It's a, a 9 volt reg. I've gone for 9 volts for the whole system. The whole monitoring system is running on 9 volts because if my battery was going flat and I started approaching 12 volts and this needed 12 volts to work you'd start to get crazy stuff going on with this and I might be there might have been an, there might be an instance where the alternator fails but I want to get home and I wouldn't want this to the talk lockup to start going crazy as my battery voltage drops or the battery could be faulty or I could have a real heavy loading on it and we might drop below 12 volts momentarily. You wouldn't want this to go crazy because if this doesn't, this has to have its correct voltage to work and you can set it to run on 5 volts, you can set it to run on 9 volts, you can set it to run on 12 volts. They're the three types of off the shelf voltage regulator you can buy 7805, 7809, 7812 for positive regs because you can get negative ones which are denoted 79 series. But anyway, that's a 9 volt reg, so 12 volts goes into it on this side, and 9 volts comes out bang steady on that side, has a ground pin in the middle. That means that if my battery got as low as 10 volts, that this will still work and won't start going crazy. I would not want to hear all clicking relays going off in here. So that's it really. Most relays actually run down to, to on a holding current, will drop as low as 5 volts before they release. So you can try that at home if you don't believe me connect a 12 volt relay to a relay to a power pack and you'll hear it click on drop your power pack down by you know putting it through a bulb or something and the relay will still hold right down to almost hardly any power then it'll finally drop off but it'll never come back on at that low power level it always needs the full power level to get back on it's to do with the way that a relay contact closes it takes a lot of effort to close it but not much to hold it same on pinball machines actually on your flippers a little <coughs> crazy feature aside a pinball flipper has two coils whack brings it in then the second coil takes over and holds it there so you're not having a heavy current holding it and getting hot same on the kick down solenoid on the gearbox a massively heavy current poof to get it there then a small little mini winding just sticks it in place and that's why on a kick down kick down relay on a to kick down solenoid on the side of your gearbox it's got three wires ground heavy coil and light coil and that's why you need a little control relay to operate that it's called a kick down relay and all ford granadas and, and all all a4 boxes have a kick down relay which just does that main current then a holding current it's a little timer i've got one that I pulled out the granada which i'll be using if you didn't have a kick down relay you can build one with a timer that's something aside <clears throat> it's all crammed in I tried I mean that was you know there's not a lot of room look I've run out of space it fits it works if you wanted to you can pour a resin in here and seal the whole lot as a sealed box it's called epoxy potting compound it's like black sometimes it's in white and it's uh, totally inert and it's used for sealing stuff from the environment if this was in the engine bay I didn't cap what's called encapsulate this with this resin turn that level you pour it in you mix it then you pour it in and it sets like rock and it also helps with heat it ke keeps everything at a uniform temperature handy when you've got components that are sensitive to temperature change in tolerance levels this it wouldn't really matter but we could encapsulate all that in one um, epoxy uh, compound and it would it would certainly need to knit up and there would be hiding a multitude of sins it would be like uh, sticking um, those sound deadening pads over crap welding on your floor pans or covering everything in bitumen or a tetra seal or whatever it is when you've done a, a poor welding pigeon job but it's actually I may be being a bit harsh on myself it's amazing that we've managed to cram it all in 
okay and you try it you know when you when you're prototyping and you've got to get big wires in here you've got to get across you've got a heat shrink you've got to have access whoa <laughs> you don't want that inside we have a little stro rogue I don't know where that came from I don't think that was in before ah it was stuck to the end of the screwdriver must have been no how did that get in there piece of wire in there no bad 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 here we are we're in there's a little trim pot so you can see to adjust that level it all works it's not running hot everything's nice and cool and that's been on long enough so lid back on we can as I say we can pot and compound that if we wanted to screw it back up we're good to go I think it's solid it's certainly been took in and out of the box enough time before I put the little blobs of glue gun in it in it in it in it in it, in it. and it's been screwed in pulled out mess with put back in and it still keeps working so if any of my connections were dodgy they'd have, they'd have fallen off by now this I'm pretty confident that's solid but if we if we uh, compound pot this it's bomb proof it's only the only thing if you do that is you're never going to repair it if it breaks but the, the electronics are so simple in it even though it looks all jam-packed together there's just it's all bulletproof stuff that's been tested time and time again a triple five you can go out and bang nails in it you can go out with it bang nails in with it all day and it'll come back and shoot dead on target every time that's a great little chip just look at that ain't that a honey so there you go you're done I'm gonna wrap this film I hope you've enjoyed these tech videos and this is now what was gonna be a half half hour film has now become over an hour film again and I try and keep it compact for you those two hour crazy heavy tech films all you guys out and girls out there overdosing on the electronics but this has to be built how can I build all that dashboard how can I build all those auto wipers and all this and in the heart of the cars that auto box and it's not got a good bulletproof torque converter lockup because half the fun with that box is the fact that yes it's got overdrive but it's got the lovely lockup feature to get that economy close to uh, a type 9 cruising condition which is a great thing and you know I like autos I always loved autos that's all I want I've got Swampy as my manual go-kart car these cruising machines when you stick it into third uh, position three on the stick it's like having a little sport mode anyway because it holds the kick down longer and it also um, just keeps it in that third gear so you can race up and down hills and you still get your kick downs as well and it is like a little mini sport box okay sorry about that sudden cut off i had to plug you into the power we lost battery i was talking about the modules talking about autos and why i liked them so i just suddenly cut off mid-sentence do apologize molex on the end of it look at that that can go into there look and it can be taken out and if if i find it's no good if i find something doesn't work all you do is copy that molex connector wiring uh, harness and build whatever you want as long as it does the same wire pins as that so you could adapt this if you wanted you could build a clone of this i could build two of these a, a mark ii version and as long as i wire the molex is the same i can just plug in my mark ii version so that's the great thing about doing it on these multi-plugs too you can just alter your modules the same applies to all the modules i've built on this they all, they all just unplug as long as you've got your wiring pinouts which I hope we have I've been making notes but I must admit my notes aren't the best I've been making notes on the back of like envelopes and little notepads instead of properly getting a, a sheet out I better go and do that that's going to be this afternoon's project a bit of homework for me not as exciting as doing all this I can tell you but it's got to be done we've got to document every Molex pinout we've got to document every fuse otherwise when it comes to fault finding or modifications you're going to be stuck so we better go and do a bit of homework whilst I'm doing that I'll start downloading this footage for the YouTubers straight to YouTube uh, I'll put it on Patreon too but it's a bit of Boxing Day bonus footage we'll call it although we're actually beyond Boxing Day now a bit of Christmas footage you'll be bored with the um, Gavin and Stacey I'm not into that I, 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 I got out of the house uh, you know you do the family rounds and then okay lovely christmas dinner and stuff then then the uh then the rubbish tv comes on back to the future was good though i did enjoy that but not gavin and stacy not for me not for thanks that's when i sneak back out into the workshop when i let them just let them do all that we'll get on to some uh, stuff hope you're enjoying your christmas break so far 
Let's hope I can get this uploaded. I don't know if I can do it. I'll try. I'm rambling again. We'll catch you in the next video. Happy New Year this time. That's going to be coming up next. So enjoy your New Year. We'll see you in the New Year. We're out again for another tech vid. PC Cortina City. Over and out. Just as a footnote, to satisfy anyone, OCD, we have slightly neatened up, just a little bit, didn't take much, a little bit of wire wrapping and just a few little tweaks on the cable, just get everything for this prototype as neat as we could, we may as well, just in case uh, anyone you thought, oh I could have, could have neatened that up, well, that's not bad now. Multi connection goes in there, the lid goes on nice, everything's locked down and solid. Anything that was wobbly or could have been wobbly was just attached down, anchored down with a with a glue. So everything's solid. I think we're good to go there. So we can put the lid on now. If we want to pot that we can pot it with the with a compound, but I just thought I'd leave you on a, a tidier note and just to show you how I finish a day off. I like to put the tools of the day just into this, into my old sink bowl. They're the current working tools that we use, and so we don't have to keep putting them in the drawers. You just use that, and then all the connectors nicely away after a good day's work. So you can just lock and load everything back away. That's our harness building tray. See the Molexes are there, or your cables. 12 volt planet, really. Those are the boys. Look. They're great. And then that's it. That's how we finish. So mini sometimes I'll leave a bit more mess. I mean there is mess over there, look. I'll do that. That's all rubbish to go and some looms to tidy up. But my immediate working area today leaves me tidy. I had this little probe which I use. Temperature, a little laser on it, a little laser point. Can just see it which I check the temperature of the key components mainly the chip and the transistor and they're just running nice just 33 degrees on them that's fine no problem with that just anything that goes over 50 you mean you've got something that's dri driving something too hard so I just give it a last check over with this after it's been on for a few hours and just check that everything's okay and nothing's getting warm just in case the circuit had a, f a fault on my design and I was drawing too much current rather than getting my current meter out and measuring every single little thing even though I've calculated the currents out you never know or it can help your spot short because don't forget that is crammed in and something can go wrong when you slide it all into the box you get a wire that you didn't quite insulate touches the edge of a copper track or the board that I've slotted in on the top side there doesn't quite fit but it does I measured it the best that I could and, and laid it out just like I said on this clip um, it was laid out it was, it was built as I went along on terms of the other modules like the timer extra timer and also off the back of the envelope diagram you never really know how big the board's going to end up being and you can break your Vera board to the right size snap the Vera board to fit but then you always think oh I need a little bit few extra tracks there or there's too many tracks and then you file the board down for me this slotted in quite nicely I must admit and you'll probably see this more than I will is that it starts to look really complicated really quick 
but it actually isn't and I know that sounds mad but I can point to every single part here and I know what it's meant to do and then you might think well this is voodoo it isn't actually I, I wish I could tell you more confident, confidently that it's not as bad as it looks all that there you can break down again we talked about this when we built the shell when we're welding the shell just look at it in small sections then add each section together that's the key to a lot of things in life that is it's little bits at a time and you'll get there the heart nicely in the middle right I will go now over now happy new year see you soon PC Well, I couldn't resist, could I? A little clip. Just at the end. Whoops. A little clip just at the end again. I think that's the third clip just at the end. Why not show you the cruise control actually fit? Because I don't think at the end of the cruise clip, halfway through this film, we got it all running, but the loom has been built. It's been fitted into the car already whilst I was doing that torque converter lockup module. So I've now got the lockup module with its lovely loom, connector, decal sticker and everything all connected in. Currently showing a good situation. Currently showing that we're locked up, which means the speed is over 45 on the bench. And also the cruise itself, and I don't think you'll see the indicator light on the dash, probably not, but Cruise on the dash lights fitted, cruise on the stalk is operational. You'll hear it for sure as we set this current speed. Boom! Now if I go over to the con speed controller on the bench, we'll be able to get it to torque. But this is all fitted into the stalk, torque stalk. And you should see this drop out and drop back in as the cruise goes crazy as well because we're going to be doing a combination of them both you won't be able to see it, I don't think I can't see any way really of showing that unless you can see it at this angle you may well be able to just about see these lights there we're currently halfway between the safety point we're actually active so we're around 50 mile an hour this will start to run these bells, you can just see them just there off I go, talking a bit louder, let's adjust the speed. Ramble is cruising and now dropped out. Locked the speed out, we should have lost the lock, the lock up as well. Cruise lost the plot because it didn't like the, the varying speed. Yes, lock converters dropped out. Let's lock back on to a higher speed. Let's go for 60 mile an hour. 60 then, lock convert, torque lock up should be on, yes it is, hopefully we can lock with a cruise now at 60, boom, boom, straight into coast and resume, coast, sorry that's completely killed, relock the speed, sorry, boom, okay, and coast, pull it up for coast, off it goes, completely drops out. The torque converter is still locked up, that's great. Resume, pull up for resume. Back to that set speed then. Completely kill. But lock converter stays on all the way through. Lock again. We, our diagnostic says the same as well. Our little test rig we can also simulate on this. Brakes on to kill the system. Resume, brake, resume, set new speed, go on, coast, coast, resume, increase speed, brake, out, done, thank you and good night. And again, this, can you see the dash indicator? I don't know if you can. It's actually lit up. We'll take you in, in a sec. Boom! Boom! Woo! 
Bo, 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 bo. Wa, 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 wa. All good there. Sounds on as usual. Uh, yep, yeah, great. We've got an antenna we can pick up. We can pick up the sound, all the sounds around. I can't got a tune in. Yes! Obviously, aerial inside the, uh, the radio, inside the... Boom! What a Christmas party! Oh, hell yeah! That's nice. Are we still on? Yes, we're still on. Cruise is off my dash. Take your cross cigarette light I just popped out. Take your cross. Come on. Come on. Live then. I'll just, I'll eject you from the tripod and you stay on as we go live. No break in the film. Straight over to the dash. Cruise light just there. Lock on. Here's my hand on the set for the cruise. Set the heart. Set the controls for the heart of the sun. Set the controls for the heart. Oh, I've turned it off. Whoops. Hang on. Toggle up. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have Houston. We have a problem. I'll try it on the manual. Right. Don't worry about that. Here we go. Sorry. Woo! Just my horn switch is a little bit broken here at the end. It's not quite pressing the horn contacts on. This is old knackered old switch. So we do it on the simulator box. That's just exactly the clone of the simulator box. So the cruise light's on. Now look what happens when we turn the lights off. We're on automatic lights, but I can override the automatic lights, turn them off. Off they go and the cruise lights a lot brighter. See how it dims down for our illumination. Don't worry, that switch is a bit iffy. We've not changed that yet. Down it goes, but stays on. Cruise is on. Vacuum bellows pushed in and unlocked on that speed. Kill on the brake by pressing this. Torque converter still locked up. Over we go. Brakes on. Light gone. Bellows out. Bellows in. Brake. Bellows out. Torque converter still locked. I drop the speed down and torque converter will drop out onto safety. We'll do that now. Just so you can see, I move the tripod with my right hand into an area where I think you're going to be able to pick up this. A little bit shaky, a little bit rubbish now for you. You're locking back into the tripod shoe, then I'll point you downwards. Hold on, a little bit shaky if you lock into the shoe. Coming back down, going to zoom into the box, end of the clip, I promise. You can all go and get back, get your turkey sandwiches. But just so you knew, we're all safe. No camera trickery here at Cortina City. Yes, the real deal. If you want a double whammy, let's hold that there. We're just, we're just spoiling you now. Bellows, we're just spoiling you. We really are. No, nope. can we get the bellows in shot all at the same time? Come on, yeah, you can do. We can do it. We can definitely do it. All we need to do is zoom you back a little bit. You're going to get both. You're going to see both actions now. The cruise will die because it loses its minimum speed, and the lockup will die as well. Here we go. Cruise going to die. Cruise just going to a faster, a slower speed. Sorry, because I've sped up on it. So cruise drops the throttle. Down it goes again. Everything happy. Lock and talk. Lock up should still be on. We're hanging around this higher range. Now, for a complete wipeout, we've lost all speed. Wipeout! Woo! Wipeout. Speed completely gone. Safety on. Lock up off. Good night. Fantastic. I promise this is the end now. What a great way to finish. Ruby's dash. All the looms in. Look at that. We've even got, we even got like a little adjustment hole there. Oh, hmm, hmm. Oh, oh. Mm. oh by the way, no, <laughs> yeah, he's done it again. Who noticed, right? That 
properly a hazard light on a Cortina as we carry the actual whole tripod back. A, tri uh, a, tri a tripod on a Cortina? A hazard light on a Cortina should alternately toggle. And when we saw us earlier on building this hazard loom, they were both at the same time. Well, don't worry, we keep things as they should be. Hazards on, please. Toggle, toggle, toggle. Easily done with just a slight adjustment courtesy of uh, Cider Andy there with his eagle eyes. I'm definitely going. Good night and thanks for watching. As always, don't be shy about uh, commenting. Don't be shy about subscribing. Don't be shy about hitting the notification bell. Don't be shy about coming and seeing the family on Patreon. If you're a big fan of Cortina City and you want to go a little bit further, you can hook up to Patreon and um, join our club. We'll see you in a bit. Anna's t-shirts, new t-shirts in the shop. Look down just at the bottom of the video, our new t-shirts courtesy of Russell Wallace, the, the master of the pen, master of the brush, master of the graphic arts. Russell Wallace's new t-shirt designs, mugs, t-shirts, hoodies and all sorts. Here we go. Happy, happy days. Happy New Year.